I'm a traveller being swept in from another land. Uh, good evening. Welcome to my live Instagram tonight. Lovely to see you joining me. I'm going to be talking about my favourite book, one of my very favourite ever books, which is called If on a Winter's Night, A Traveller, which is by Italo Calvino. And the reason I wanted to talk about this book tonight is because I've just been reunited with the book after hundreds of years of absence. So this is a book, oh my God, look at that, which has my name and my first boyfriend's name. That's how old it is. Hugo and Bella, it says. I used to be known as Bella when I bought this book. Uh, that's another whole long story in itself. And my friend Susan Elderkin, who I wrote the novel Cure with, eventually, suddenly gave me back this book a couple of nights ago, revealing that she'd had it sitting on her shelf for probably the last nearly 10 years. And it's actually so exciting to get it back not only because I love it, um, but also because it's full of notes inside it. There we go. Um, that's just an example. Not just by me, but also by Suze. I don't know if you can see that. There's some very faint writing because she's much more polite with her annotations in books than I am. Most of my annotations are in biro because I'm much more of an abuser of books, unlike Sue's. Uh, look, there we go. Suddenly, I appears, it says. So I wanted to talk about this book tonight because it's a book I really love and because I've just been reunited with it. And it's a book that I do talk about often to people because it's all about the joy of reading. It's a book which is very much a meta narrative. And um, I am wearing this cloak because I want to be a traveller tonight, but I'm also going to take it off and reveal my fabulous cowboy shirt because I'm actually getting quite hot, believe it or not, even though it's blooming freezing outside. So If on a Winter's Night a Traveller, was written in 1979 and it's by the Italian writer Italo Calvino. I wonder if anyone out there is a fellow lover of the book. Do tell me if you are. I'd love to know. Send me a comment. It's a postmodernist narrative and it has a frame story which is about a reader trying to read a book called if on a winter's night a traveller. So you get the gist, it's already very much a meta narrative. Each chapter is divided into two sections. The first section is in the second person. So it's written to you, the reader, and it describes the process that the reader goes through to attempt to read the next chapter of the book that he or she is reading. Then the second half is the first part of the new book that the reader, you finds. The second half is always about something different from the previous ones. Um, so it was written in 1979, published in English in 1981, obviously written originally in the Italian by Italo Calvino. And by the way, for people that don't know Italo, Car Italo Calvino, he wrote a lot of amazingly brilliant books, including Cosmic Comics, which is another massive favourite book of mine, which I have done lots of art based on the, sh the short stories, Cosmic Comics. And that's something I will talk about another evening because they are just so utterly brilliant. Sorry, just trying to adjust my camera. Um, he's also famous for Invisible Cities, which is all about architecture. Um, the Path to the Nest of Spiders, Baron in the Trees, um, many other books. Mine's suddenly gone a blank. But he was an amazing writer. He was in a group called Wilipo, which were a group of mostly French and Italian intellectuals who used to set themselves problems 
which they solved in the form of a piece of literature. So, for instance, one of their books, one of their members was Georges Perec, who wrote a book called La Vie Mode d'Emploi, Life, a User's Manual. And he wrote that book as if it was a game of chess. So, in a highly complicated way, each chapter is a knight's move away from the previous chapter. And there's all sorts of amazing mathematical things going on in that book, as well as the whole chess thing. And he also famously wrote an amazing book called A Void in English, which is translated from the French. And that's a book which doesn't use the letter E throughout the whole book because um, he was talking about the way that his mother had disappeared in Auschwitz and she had left a hole, a massive, irredeemable, terrible hole. And the only way that he felt that he could write about it was to write a book with something fundamentally important missing, the letter E. And he wrote an entire book without using the letter E, which is a phenomenal accomplishment in his own language. Then it was translated by his amazing translator, whose name is Belloc. And that in itself is also an incredible feat and accomplishment. Anyway, so that's Perec, member of the Wilipo group, who Calvino was also a member of. And that's just to explain the fact that Calvino was part of this merry group of authors who love to give themselves strange and difficult mathematical or philosophical problems, which they would then answer in their books. And in If on a Winter's Night a Traveller, Calvino is, it's not really a problem that he's addressing, but he's writing all about the experience of reading a book. And I will read some of it to you in a minute. So the book begins with a chapter on the art and nature of reading, and it's subsequently divided into 22 passages. The odd numbered passages and the final passage are narrated in the second person. So that's another thing. The fact that it's or most of it or lots of it, half of it is written to you makes it a very discombobulating read when you first start reading it. Because all books in the second person are always quite bizarre to read. Um, but this one is even more so because you, the reader, are being directly addressed by Calvino, the author. And he is writing to you very much as if you really are you and you believe it. You buy into the fact that you are the you in the book until um, he changes that halfway through the book because he starts acting as if you is actually a person that he has invented. So it's all very complicated. And some people find the experience of reading this book deeply infuriating. Um, and I will just tell you a little bit more about the structure of the book. So each chapter has a title, which is something that follows on from the previous chapter title. So to read you the entirety of the chapter titles does tell a story. And you don't realise that until you've read the whole book. But it's fun to know it in advance because it does mean that you understand the book a bit more as you read it. So the chapter headings go, If on a winter's night a traveller, outside the town of Malbork, leaning from the steep slope without fear of wind or vertigo, looks down in gathering shadow in a network of lines that enlace, in a network of lines that intersect, on the carpet of leaves illuminated by the moon, around an empty grave, what story down there awaits its end? And that is it. That's all the chapter titles. And as you can see, you are actually left on a cliffhanger, even when you put all those titles together. And that's what's frustrating and brilliant about the book, is that he ends each chapter on a cliffhanger, and they're not necessarily resolved, but they are kind of resolved. So I'm going to read you the very beginning of the book, the first chapter, and that will give you an idea of whether you would love 
or be deeply frustrated by the book. Uh, here we go. Um, by the way, hello, Colleen and Sharon and Helen. Lovely to see you all here this evening. Um, I am very much enjoying bringing back out from my shelves If on a Winter's Night a Traveller, just because it is a book very close to my heart. Written in 1979, so that's 44 years ago, which is a long time ago, let's face it. Anyway, here we go with the beginning of the book. You are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. Relax, concentrate, dispel every other thought. Let the world around you fade. Best to close the door. The TV is always on in the next room. Tell the others right away. No, I don't want to watch TV. Raise your voice. They don't hear you otherwise. I'm reading. I don't want to be disturbed. Maybe they haven't heard you with all that racket. Speak louder. Yell. I'm beginning to read Italo Calvino's new novel. Or if you prefer, don't say anything. Just hope they'll leave you alone. Find the most comfortable position. Seated, stretched out, curled up or lying flat. Flat on your back, on your side, on your stomach. In an easy chair, on the sofa, in the rocker, the deck chair, on the hassock, in the hammock, if you have a hammock. On top of your bed, of course, or in the bed. You can even stand on your hands, head down in the yoga position, with the book upside down, naturally. See, this is where I get most of my inspiration for different ways of reading. Of course, the ideal position for reading is something you can never find. In the old days, they used to read standing up, at a lectern. People were accustomed to standing on their feet without moving. They rested like that when they were tired of horseback riding. Nobody ever thought of reading on horseback, and yet now, I did, by the way, the idea of sitting in the saddle, the book propped against the horse's mane, or maybe tied to the horse's ear with a special harness, seems attractive to you. With your feet in the stirrups, you should feel quite comfortable for reading. Having your feet up is the first condition for enjoying a read. I wonder what your favourite reading positions are, people out there. Um, <clears throat> I do love to sit in my hanging chair, which is currently downstairs, but I'm going to bring it back up here because I like having it in this room. <coughs> I love to swing in the chair, disconnected from the world. <coughs> but I also do love lying in a hammock, lying on a beach, curled up on the sofa, lying in bed. Reading outside is also one of my favourite activities, reading in a tree. But obviously, in the current weather, that is not necessarily that achievable. Well, what are you waiting for? Stretch your legs. Go ahead and put your feet on a cushion, on two cushions, on the arms of the sofa, on the wings of the chair, on the coffee table, on the desk, on the piano, on the globe. Take your shoes off first. If you want to, put your feet up. If not, put them back. Now don't stand there with your shoes in one hand and the book in the other. Adjust the light so you won't strain your eyes. Do it now because once you're absorbed in reading, there will be no budging you. Make sure the page isn't in shadow. A clotting of black letters on a grey background. Uniform as a pack of, sorry, as a pack of mice. A pack of mice. A pack of mice, that is what it says. But be careful that the light cast on isn't too strong, doesn't glare on the cruel white of the paper, gnawing at the shadows of the letters, as in a southern noonday. Try to foresee now everything that might make you interrupt your reading. Cigarettes within reach if you smoke, and the ashtray. Anything else? Do you have to pee? All right, you know best. It's not that you expect anything in particular from this particular book. You're the sort of person who, in principle, no longer expects anything of anything. There are plenty younger than you or less young who live in the expectation of extraordinary experiences from books, from people, from journeys, from events, from what tomorrow has in store. But not you. 
you know that the best you can expect is to avoid the worst. This is the conclusion you have reached in your personal life and also in general matters, even international affairs. Is that true? What about books? Well, precisely because you have denied it in every other field. You believe you may still grant yourself legitimately this youthful pleasure of expectation in a carefully circumscribed area like the field of books, where you can be lucky or unlucky, but the risk of disappointment isn't serious. So then you notice in the newspaper that if on a winter's night a traveller had appeared, the new book by Italo Calvino, who hadn't published for several years. You went to the bookshop and bought the volume. Good for you. In the shop window, you've promptly identified the cover with the title that you're looking for. Following this visual trail, you've forced your way through the shop past the thick barricade of books you haven't read, which were frowning at you from the tables and shelves, trying to cow you. But you know you must never allow yourself to be awed that among them there extend for acres and acres the books you needn't read, the books made for purposes other than reading. What are they? The books read even before you open them, since they belong to the category of books read before being written. And thus you pass the outer girdle of ramparts, but then you are attacked by the infantry of the books that if you had more than one life, you would certainly also read. But unfortunately, your days are numbered. With a rapid manoeuvre, you bypass them and into the phalanxes of the books you mean to read. But there are others you must read first. The book's too expensive now and you'll wait till they're remaindered. The books ditto when they come out in paperback. Books you can borrow from somebody. Books that everybody's read. So it's as if you had read them too. Finding these assaults sorry, eluding these assaults, you come up beneath the towers of the fortress where other troops are holding out. The books you've been planning to read for ages, the books you've been hunting for years without success, the books dealing with something you're working on at the moment, the books you want to own. So they'll be handy just in case. The books you could put aside maybe to read this summer, the books you need to go with other books on your shelves, the books that fill you with sudden, inexplicable curiosity, not easily justified. Now you've been able to reduce the countless embattled troops to an array that is, to be sure, very large, but still calculable in a finite number. But this relative relief is then undermined by the ambush of the books read long ago, which is true, which is now time to reread, and the books you've always pretended to have read, and now it's time to sit down and really read them. With a zigzag dash, you shake them off and leap straight into the citadel of the new books whose author or subject appeals to you. Even inside this stronghold, you can make some breaches in the ranks of the defenders, dividing them into new books by authors or on subjects not new for you or in general, and new books by authors or on subjects completely unknown, at least to you, and defining the attraction they have for you on the basis of your desires and needs for the new and the not new, for the new you seek in the not new and for the not new you seek in the new. And all this simply means that, having rapidly glanced over the titles of the volumes displayed in the bookshop, you have turned towards a stack of, if on a winter's night a traveller, fresh off the press. You've grasped a copy and you've carried it to the cashier so that your right to own it can be established. Um, I could go on because it's such a great beginning of the book. You are completely grabbed by it. And I do remember reading it for the very first time uh, back in 1980. It must have been. And being completely awestruck by it. And one thing that I've written in it in the very front in my rather messy inky scrawl is... The writer's salvation lies in seducing the reader. And I do believe that was a quote from Mario Vargas Llosa, the Peruvian writer. And Calvino very much is a believer in seducing the reader. And that is totally what he does through this brilliant but frustrating and compelling book. So we have the reader 
who is you and you do relate to them to the reader uh partly because it's written in the second person and you can't help but identify with them but then you slowly start to think hang on Calvino was saying that me the reader is someone who's ceased to expect much from life but maybe I do expect things from books is that true maybe not maybe you are someone who still expects things from life even from the government uh so you might begin to uh, cut yourself off from this imaginary reader who's meant to be you and therefore you begin to realise that this you is actually a different character not you, the reader uh, and so you start perceiving them as a character within the book and that does happen more and more throughout the book the you character becomes more and more of a character separated from you and therefore they become a character in their own right who is falling in love with another character in the book and you begin to believe in their relationship fully. So I'll just read you the beginning of chapter two which is <clears throat> excuse me when you first uh, meet another character in the book. The novel begins in a railway station so hang on, the title of this chapter, by the way, is If in a Winter's Night a Traveller, so it's the first chapter of the book, within the book. The novel begins in a railway station. A locomotive huffs. Steam from a piston covers the opening of the chapter. A cloud of smoke hides part of the first paragraph. In the odour of the station, there's a passing whiff of station cafe odour. There's someone looking through the befogged glass. He opens the door of the bar. Everything is misty inside too, as if seen by near selected eyes, or eyes irritated by coal dust. The pages of the book are clouded, like the windows of an old train. The cloud of smoke rests on the sentences. It is a rainy evening. The man enters the bar. He unbuttons his damp overcoat. A cloud of steam enfolds him. A whistle dies away, along tracks that are glistening with rain, as far as the eye can see. So don't you just love that, the way the steam is actually wafting over the writing of the book? So it's another um, metafiction moment where you're stepping back from the reading of the book, seeing the steam going over the pages of the imaginary book within the book. And this is another aspect of the novel being completely um, postmodern. And this is one of the reasons that some people find it a difficult read. I've actually been looking at reviews online uh, more recently by people who found this book just too annoying, who loved it at the beginning and then started getting alienated from it because of the way that it's written in this very um, removed fashion, or not removed, but in this very meta fashion. But I do think that if you are a lover of the act of reading, then you are going to enjoy this book very much, I hope. But I'd love to know your thoughts and comments if you do read it, or indeed if you've already read it. So I want to read you a couple more classic passages, um, just to give you a bit more of an idea of the brilliance of the book. I do apologise on Facebook, it seems to be not the best quality for some reason. Um, I think it seems to be much better on Instagram. Anyway, um, there's a bit that I've written a comment next to here, um, probably at least 30 years ago, that says Tristram Shandy. And this is a book very much because it's about the act of reading that refers back to of course various other writers over the years and one of those that he's definitely referring to is Tristram Shandy a book by Lawrence Stern which was written sometime in the early 1700s and it was one of the first brilliant English novels one of the first novels ever written and that's a book that takes all kinds of amazing literary flourishes. It was one of the first books to really mess around with the reader's head, 
to talk directly to the reader and to use kind of flourishes, which were literally um, drawings on the page. He used black pages. He spoke to the reader. He went on ridiculous digressions and told you that he was going on ridiculous direct digressions. And this Italo Calvino novel is very much referring to some of the clever and brilliant and strange things that were also going on in other such books. Now, I'm just quickly trying to rescue myself from the Facebook disaster that seems to be happening by closing down a few things on my computer that are maybe stopping it from being good quality. So sorry, bear with me one second while I try to have a technological moment. Um, I do apologise for the interruption. Maybe I can just close things down. Uh, hopefully that will help and make the quality on Facebook a bit better. Anyway, to continue, Tristram Shandy, here we go. So this is a bit from the middle of the book, um, which is all about the very fact that Calvino is constantly digressing when he's writing his novel. So, I'm producing too many stories at once because what I want is for you to feel around the story a saturation of other stories that I could tell, and maybe will tell, or who knows, may already have told on some other occasion, a space full of stories that perhaps is simply my lifetime, where you can move in all directions, as in space, always finding stories that cannot be told until other stories are told first. And so, setting out from any moment or place, you encounter always the same density of material to be told. In fact, Looking in perspective at everything I'm leaving out of the main narration, I see something like a forest that extends in all directions and is so thick that it doesn't allow light to pass. A material, in other words, much richer than what I have chosen to put in the foreground this time. So it is not impossible that the person who follows my story may feel himself a bit cheated, seeing that the stream is dispersed into so many trickles and that of the essential events only the last echoes and reverberations arrive at him. But it is not impossible that this is the very effect I aimed at when I started narrating, or let's say it's a trick of the narrative art that I'm trying to employ, a rule of discretion that consists in maintaining my position slightly below the narrative possibilities at my disposal, which, if you look closer, is the sign of real wealth solid and vast, in the sense that, if we'll assume I had only one story to tell, I would make a huge fuss over this story and would end up botching it in my rage to show it in its true light. But actually, having an, in reserve a virtually unlimited supply of narratable material, I am in a position to handle it with detachment and without haste, even allowing a certain irritation to be perceptible, perceptible and granting myself the luxury of expatiating on secondary episodes and insignificant details. <laughs> so there we go. Um, some people would just get a bit frustrated with these digressions and endless self-referential moments. But the joy of the book is that there is enough of a massive story going on. There are moments of detective novel uh, behaviour coming in. There's moments of thriller action. There's also a romance and seduction going on within the book. So it is a sexy kind of read, strangely enough, which you might not imagine from what I've read to you so far, because it seems so uh, as if it's the meta textual side of reading. But it's actually full of really great narrative as well. Um, so I'm going to read you a little bit more. And I am going to make tonight not a long session because there's just too much going on with the madness of December. Now we're talking about the other reader. 
What you like, other reader, it is time for this book in the second person to address itself no longer to a general male you, perhaps brother and double of a hypocrite, I, but directly to you who appeared already in the second chapter as the third person necessary for the novel to be a novel, for something to happen between that male second person and the female third, for something to take form, develop or deteriorate according to the phases of human events, or rather to follow the mental models through which we live our human events, or rather to follow the mental models through which we attribute to human events the meanings that allow them to be lived. This book so far has been careful to leave open to the reader who is reading the possibility of identifying himself with the reader who is read. This is why he was not given a name, which would automatically have made him the equivalent of a third person, of a character, whereas to you, as third person, a name had to be given, Lud Miller. So Lud Miller, by the way, is a key character in this book. And so he has been kept a pronoun in the abstract condition of pronouns suitable for any attribute and any action. Let us see, other reader, if the book can succeed in drawing a true portrait of you, beginning with the frame and enclosing you from every side, establishing the outlines of your form. You appeared for the first time to the reader in a bookshop. You took shape, detaching yourself from a wall of shelves, as if the quantity of books made the presence of a young lady reader necessary. Your house, being the place in which you read, can tell us the position books occupy in your life. If they are a defence you set up to keep the outside world at a distance, if they are a dream into which you sink as if into a drug, or bridges you cast towards the outside, towards the world, that interests you so much that you want to multiply and extend its dimensions through books. To understand this, our reader knows that the first step is to visit the kitchen. Um, so that's another bit which is very much messing with your head. Let's face it talking about the third person in the book and all the bits I've read to you so far have been very much uh, aspects of the novel which show it as being about the act of reading. So I do just want to read you a little bit that shows that there is narrative in the book as well because um, I worry that I might be putting people off by reading you all the bits that are all about the, the fact that it's such a meta-narrative. So here we go. I'm pretty hopeful that this is a moment of narrative. We're getting quite near the end of the book here, and it's the chapter called On the Carpet of Leaves Illuminated by the Moon. And one thing that you have to remember with Calvino is that he does write incredibly beautifully, and he has an incredible turn of phrase. And many of his uh, beautiful phrases are ones that if you take them on their own, you want to turn them into paintings. They're just so evocative and beautiful, like on the carpet of leaves illuminated by the moon or in a network of lines that embrace. And when we get to his other books like Cosmic Comics, um, they're full of absolutely amazing evocative concepts, ideas, images, colours concepts, ideas about the beginnings of the world and humanity. And he's just got such an incredibly um, imaginative mind, which is so full of amazing ways of expressing what it is to be alive. That's why I love Italo Calvino. So here we go. Here's a bit of this book, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller from the chapter on the carpet of leaves, illuminated by the moon. The jinko leaves fell like fine rain from the boughs and dotted the lawn with yellow. I was walking with Mr. Arcada on the path of smooth stones. I said I would like to distinguish the sensation of each single jinko leaf from the sensation of all the others, but I was wondering if it would be possible. Mr. Arcada said it was possible. The premises from which I set out and which Mr. Okada considered well-founded, were the following. 
If from the jinko tree a single little yellow leaf falls and rests on the lawn, the sensation, the sensation felt in looking at it is that of a single yellow leaf. If two leaves descend from the tree, the eye follows the twirling of the two leaves as they move closer, then separate in the air like two butterflies chasing each other, then glide finally to the grass, one here, one there. And so, with three, with four, even with five, as the number of leaves spinning in the air increases further, the sensations corresponding to each of them are summed up, creating a general sensation like that of silent rain. I'm going to stop there because that's not the narrative bit that I was thinking of. That was a bit that actually really reminded me of a book by Sheila Haiti, which, laughing, John, you're here. You read as well, if you're listening at this moment. Remind me what that book was called, because it was all about colour and leaves and meditation. And it was I had a passage which was very much similar to that. Um, I'm waiting to be reminded, <laughs> if possible, what that book was. Anyway, um, possibly that might be all that I'm going to read to you from this amazing, magical, strange and brilliant book. Um, there's so much of it that is about the act of writing. I feel it is a book that will be loved more by people who love writing itself and love thinking about reading and love thinking about what it is to be taking part of an, in a narrative um, than by people who actually want to just jump into a narrative and be swept along on the wave of the narrative. Um, some people might find it a tad frustrating because you keep being getting swept up in a story momentarily within the book and then he takes a step back and um, starts talking about the act of reading and the act of writing and therefore it can be quite a frustrating read. And I do remember when I first read it myself back in my university days that I did have moments of getting frustrated. So I do sympathise, but it's worth persevering and going back and rereading or spending more time with it. Now, uh, when Susan Elderkin and I wrote the novel Cure, we talked about the fact that we had been drawn together by this book because it was one of the very first books that we ever bonded about when we were in adjacent rooms at Cambridge University. And when we'd finished writing the book, Susan wrote a really beautiful epilogue to the book, which was all about If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. Uh, and it's written in the style of Calvino. And I'm going to read you this epilogue because I think it really brilliantly captures the experience of reading Italo Calvino. And it's a really lovely short piece of writing by Susan at the end of the novel Cure. The reader had just opened a new book, Mallory's La Mort d'Arthur, perhaps, or Spencer's The Fairy Queen, as it was medieval literature that first term, when there was a knock on the door. Come in, she called a little absently, for she was gone with the gentle knights and damsels. Somewhat rudely, she did not look up when the door opened, but kept her eyes trained on the page. But then a joyful, hello, broke her reading bubble. There in a kaleidoscope of mismatched colours and patterns stood the other reader. That's me. She held a steaming mug in each hand. The first, and for a while, the only thing, the only thing the reader noticed about her were her eyes. Swathes of turquoise, pink, green and gold, spanned outwards from her eyes to her brows, as if she were an iridescent fish. Sounds familiar. A fish that was delighted to see her, that was in fact bestowing on her the sort of crazed smile one generally reserves for one Siamese twin, tragically detached at birth, 
But who has now, 18 years later, unexpectedly moved into the room next door? In an instant, the reader decided to love her back. I see I've interrupted you in the middle of the Fairy Queen, said the other reader, handing her a mug of black coffee. She took it black from that day on. Do you feel you're lacking in virtues? Good God! Her eyes, which of course had been scanning the bookshelves, had come to rest on a copy of If on a Winter's Night a Traveller, which had been strategically positioned at one end, next to the unbearable likeness of being, the bell jar, the house of the spirits, you get the picture, so that its title could be seen by anyone casually passing the open door. The other reader put down her copy, took the Calvino and turned it over lovingly in her hands. The horror of not being able to finish the story, of being interrupted just at the moment when it said it's most gripping, that feeling of complete desperation at wanting to know what happens next, she began. The other reader looked at the reader breathlessly. The reader could only nod solemnly because this had become suddenly the first really important moment of her life involving someone to whom she wasn't in fact related. She reached out her hand and the other reader passed the book to her and she flipped through it until she found the bit she loved the most, the bit that describes all the different categories of books in a bookshop, the books that if you'd had more than one life you would certainly also read but unfortunately your days are numbered. I read that to you at the beginning, by the way, I'm sure you'll remember. And the books that everybody's read, so it's as if you had read them too. And the other reader said, yes, yes, and began to laugh. And so she laughed as well, and the other reader grabbed the book back and flipped through until, increasingly desperate, she too found the bit she wanted. The bit where the way we circle a book before we read it is described. Scanning the blurb, touching the cover. How that's like the foreplay, before sex. And this projects us into the consummation, which is, of course, the act of reading itself. Reading it aloud, the other reader burst out laughing again, because she found the sexual metaphor somewhat embarrassing, considering the short duration of their friendship. But the reader was laughing too, and she snatched the book back again, because she hadn't finished the reading the bit about the bookshop, the bit that she felt sure the other reader would love as much as she did, where it describes the way all the books you didn't buy look at you tragically, as you leave with a different book, like the rejected dogs in the dog pound. And in her determination to reclaim the book, she pulled a bit too hard, and for a moment the book threatened to tear along the spine between them, and they were both struck simultaneously with what a strange irony this would be if the book were to be separated into two halves and could no longer be read, interrupted just before the climax or just after, just as the books within the book can no longer be read. Their eyes met over the tortured book. Of course. One reads alone, even in another's presence, the other reader said. But what is more natural than the solidarity, a complicity, a bond that should be established between reader and reader, thanks to the book, the reader replied. The other reader nodded. She was about to hand the book back when something seemed to occur to her. But... Are books a defence you set up to keep the outside world at a distance? A dream into which you sink as if into a drug? Or bridges you cast towards the world that interests you so much that you want to multiply and extend its dimensions through books? The reader already knew her answer to this question. All three, she replied, but particularly the drug. The other reader nodded. She understood. She slid if on a winter's night a traveller back into the bookcase, in the middle of, in the middle this time. They would use the drugs forever, together, from now on. So that was Suze, Susan Aldigan, writing a really lovely epilogue to the novel Cure, all about how we were brought together by this book back in the days when we were at Cambridge University together. Uh, and it's true. We've been taking these drugs together ever since. So much that we wrote a book all about them. And we love to share those drugs with you. Um, laughing John, great to see you back. Um, by the way, John, can you remember the name of that book? Which is the one, I think it's by Sheila Haiti which is about the leaf, that's the consciousness of the leaf. Is it called pure colour? 
or something like that. Are you there? John, can you remember? It's bugging me now because it was it's very much like um, some of this book. There are sections within If on a Winter's Night which are very meditative in the same way as that book is. Um, I'm just going to see if I can find it while people are still here and then I'm going to shortly come to an end. Uh, Pure Colour! It is called Pure Colour. Um, so yeah, sorry that I couldn't remember that. Thank you! Yay! We got it. Um, so yes, read If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. It's a brilliant book all about how important reading is and what it does to you. It's fiction, but it's also metafiction because it takes you back into your own consciousness to think about what reading is doing to you at this moment. And it is all completely quite a massive explosion of madness going on in your brain. But it's also uh, a great story, even though it does leave you hanging multiple times in a really frustrating way. So it is often a bit frustrating as a general read. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to come to an end. But uh, next week, uh, which is something like the 16th of December, I'm going to be doing my books of the year on Damien Barr's Literary Salon. Facebook and Instagram. So I'm looking forward to that and I'd love to know what your books of the year are. Do tell me, send me comments, let, let me know what have been your favourite reads of the year and I'll be revealing mine next week. Um, and that will actually be the last one of this year that I'm going to do because the week after that will be practically Christmas. Uh, so um, do send me any questions that you have of a bibliotherapy nature. Do send me topics that you'd like me to cover if you have any burning questions or ideas or thoughts about books. Also, do book a bibliotherapy session for yourself or a loved one. It makes a great Christmas gift. Um, and generally have a great December and see you next week. Good night.